All right, hello everybody. Welcome to part B of lecture 26. Let's talk about the national banking system. All right, for part A, we look, took a look at industrialization and post-Civil War America, huge changes. Thomas Jefferson's old dream of, of, a, of a very humble, decentralized agrarian republic has fully yielded way to the or Hamiltonian vision of an industrial empire. And this industrial empire needs capital, 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 and credit and, and finance. And, and that capital will be provided by the Republican Party and by the National Banking Acts passed during the American Civil War. Now, in 1861, the United States was still predominantly based on a free banking system. There were no federal banks. Each state had their own banking regulations, but for the most part, free banking. Well, the Republican Party, as a result of the Civil War, dominated the federal government, and Republicans inherited the old Henry Clay, Alexander Hamilton view on a need for federal banking, for some sort of national banking, um, whether it be a central bank or something like we're about to see here. Now, the problem with the central bank, by this point in time, central banking was pretty unpopular. I mean, Jackson killed it in the 1830s, and that was seen as a, a a, a, a sort of a said and done deal, all right? Um, the bank was dead, okay? This, the bank of the United States is not coming back. And so what the Republicans do is they create a new system called the national banking system. And this is one of the ways in which um, the, the Civil War was funded or financed. Now, what was the national banking system? Well, beginning in 1863, there were a series of acts passed from 1863 to 1865 called the National Banking Acts, and this replaced the free banking system. What it did, it created a new office in Washington, D.C., under the auspices of the federal government called the Comptroller of the Currency, and this official was responsible for chartering national banks. And note the plural there, not a national bank, not a bank in the United States, but national banks. And there will be many of them, hundreds and hundreds, actually almost 2,000 national banks will be chartered during this period. And the treasury was now permitted to deposit funds in those national banks. You remember the independent treasury system that was created after the Panic of 1837? Now the treasury still have an independent treasury system that the treasury can use, but the treasury, if it wants to, can also deposit funds in the national banks. All right, so who could be chartered as a national bank? Any institution that met minimum requirements could obtain that charter. So actually, there are some similarities here with the free banking system. It's just on a national level, and it's run by the federal government. Some of those minimum requirements uh, yet included minimum capital requirements. For rural banks, you had to have a minimum of $50,000 in capital. For larger cities, you had to have a minimum of $200,000 in capital. That was a lot of money. So you have those capital requirements. If you met those capital requirements and a few other stipulations, you could apply to the comptroller for a charter and receive that national charter from the federal government. What did this give you the, the right to do? Well, not only could the treasury deposit funds in your bank if it, if it so chose, but as a national bank, you had the right to issue banknotes, redeemable on demand and specie. After 1865, only national banks, only national banks had the right to issue banknotes. Okay, remember the old state banks, the state banks, they no longer have the right to issue banknotes. Only national banks may issue those banknotes. And Somewhat like the free banking system, but now on the federal level, each banknote, each banknote had to be secured by an equivalent sum or value of federal bonds lodged with the U.S. Treasury. All right, and this off this gave security to the national banknotes. I'll have a balance sheet here 
on screen to, to illustrate in a moment. But let's take a look at some of these banknotes. Okay, here they are. And actually, the comptroller was in charge of regulated the printing of these. And so you have a basic template here for many of these national banks. Notice you still have the, the name of the bank on the note. Okay, these notes say national currency, national currency, but then the merchants, National Bank of Hillsborough, or first, National Bank of the City of New York. So these are still the notes of that bank, but it's a national bank, it's called national currency. And then notice the other thing. This note is secured by bonds of the United States deposited with the U.S. Treasurer in Washington. This note is secured by bonds of the United States deposited with the U.S. Treasurer at Washington. There's another national currency note. National Broadway Bank of New York. Here you get a look at the back. That's the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Really cool notes. So these, these notes are very beautiful in their own right. But you see they're more standardized now, a bit more standardized. National currency, United States of America, the first national bank of Verdun, $100, $100. Still redeemable on demand and coin for anybody who had this note. And if you had a $100 note, that's a lot of money. $100 was a lot of money. Um, Twenty dollars was a lot of money too, but uh, you know more in reach of common people. You could take that twenty dollar note, go to the bank, and get twenty silver dollars or two gold eagles. There's a one dollar note of the Central National Bank of Chicago. A one dollar note, a bit smaller. This note secured by bonds of the United States. Um, to illustrate a transition here, you'll remember this note during the free banking era. This was the St. Nicholas Bank. Remember the St. Nicholas Bank and St. Nicholas Bank. Uh, St. Nicholas was the had become somewhat the patron saint of the city of New York, kind of uh, hearkening back to the city's Dutch heritage. <laughs> There's St. Nick himself with reindeer. This was during the free banking era. So you see, secured by pledge of public stocks, but public stocks in the state of New York, in the state of New York, not federal bonds, state bonds under this old system. These were some other notes from the free banking era, St. Nicholas of the St. Nicholas Bank, some more Santa Claus, secured by pledge of public stocks in New York, secured by pledge of public stocks in New York. Well, the St. Nicholas Bank, after the early 1860s, converted into a national bank. And so now their notes look different. There's the new note. It's, it's a different note. I actually, like the, I like the earlier ones. I like the earlier ones a little better. But this is still a very beautiful note. Don't get me wrong. But the St. Nicholas National Bank. Oh, now the St. Nicholas National Bank of New York. This note secured by bonds of the United States. Of the United States, a $1 bill. Very, very beautiful note. Like I said, I kind of like, I kinda like this, this other. One, one thing I liked about the free banking system, as a result of its hyper decentralization you just had a lot more artistic creativity in the, in the notes some of that goes away during this during this year but you still have some flexibility and so you still have compared to the notes today uh very diverse um designs and, and such but there there is a template now and here are a few additional notes just for your enjoyment uh yeah. these are beautiful notes all right these are these are exquisitely beautiful made sense in fact i'm envious right now of uh of how beautiful this currency is compared to to ours today here's george washington crossing the delaware back in december 1776 epic epic the goddess of liberty with victory over her head and there of course the mayflower the the mayflower the pilgrims crossing the atlantic into the new world very very cool note why can't we have a note like this today? Um, this, this is good stuff. And here's some others. First National Bank of Lebanon in the state of Indiana. Secured by bonds. 
It's like some militiamen, maybe Minutemen during the American Revolutionary War. This is a common template. You see this de design in a lot of notes. Pretty awesome. I can see why some people get into numismatics. I resist it because I, I it, that could really be a sinkhole for, for a lot of, uh, of money there if I got into collecting these notes. But, you know, if I, I had to collect one thing, this might be, this might rank pretty high up there. This is a, a, the First National Bank of Hawaii. First National Bank of Hawaii. So probably sometime in the late 1890s, maybe early 20th century. Honolulu. All right, let's take a look at the, the, the balance sheet. It's actually very similar, okay? This was free banking. Remember the free banking balance sheet. You have $100,000 in demand liabilities if you're running this bank. You decide on a 15% reserve ratio, so you have $15,000 of, of gold and silver coin in your vaults. But because of free banking laws, you have to secure all of these banknotes by state bonds. And so you also have in your asset column $20,000 of state bonds. And those bonds were lodged in the state treasury. And then the remaining 65% you could invest in other things. Usually would have a higher return in bonds. This is the national banking, all right? You see the free banking, bam, national banking. Same thing, only now it's federal bonds, federal bonds, okay? Secured by federal bonds. Does that make sense? So that if any of these national banks went under, if a national bank went under, if you had this note, you could redeem, you would receive the money for that note because the U.S. Treasurer at Washington, D.C. has on hand the federal bonds that belong to that bank. And then they can sell those bonds and receive the cash and redeem your notes. Adding that additional security to the system. Now, remember when my, in the, the lecture on the Civil War, I noted how Jay Cook had a monopoly on underwriting the uh, sale of U.S. bonds during the Civil War through some inside connections. Well, Jay Cook obviously has a very strong interest in selling bonds. He played a key role in designing the National Banking Acts and design for the system of national banks to purchase large amounts of, of federal bonds. Because if now all of a sudden you require that all banknotes be secured by federal bonds, now the, the demand for federal bonds will go through the roof, all right? And so national banks were actually one of Cook's biggest customers. In fact, Cook himself set up national banks in Philadelphia, in Washington, D.C., and uh, the largest national bank in New York, which was uh, the fourth national bank of New York. And then some of Cook's agents set up banks in the South and in the West. So you, you, you essentially here have an assured built-in market for federal debt. And, and there, was a, there was a lot of federal debt. Civil War was extremely expensive. And, and not just during the war itself. The Civil War created an entire class, something maybe close to a million pensioners. People who collected an annual pension, veterans, veterans of the war who collected an annual pension from the federal government. This was the nation's first entitlement system. And it was costly. And so the federal budget goes up. There's a greater need for, for borrowing. And, and the national banking system fits into that quite well. Now, interstate, interestingly enough, interstate branch banking remained illegal. So if you were the fourth national bank at New York, you could only have branches in New York. Now, your notes might and would circulate outside of New York, especially if you were a big bank. But the branches itself could only be within that state. All national bank notes circulated at par. All right, that was a requirement. If you were a national bank, you were obligated to accept all other national bank notes all of the national currency at par. And then from time to time, quarterly, biannually, uh, 
You'll get together with other banks in the region at clearing houses and exchange your banknotes and settle any balances. So the, the fact that national banknotes circulated at par provided, again, a surprising amount of uniformity to the system. So that, you know, I get, this looks chaotic, right? When we look at, oh my gosh, look at all these notes. Like how, what did people, you know, make of all of this? And, and how could they distinguish between one note and the other? And, and the simple answer to that is they didn't need to distinguish. They didn't need to distinguish. They all circulated at par. Look at how many national banks there were. There's a lot of national banks. Okay, because you have rural and you have big city banks. So that by 1873, there's almost 2,000, and you have almost $2 billion worth of national bank notes and demand deposits. And uh, you'll remember this slide from the uh, free banking lecture, Clearing House Associations. I won't, I won't repeat that. But, you know, coming together, exchanging notes, and then settling your balances, this helps provide that, uni that uniformity. Oh, there it is. Some more, some more notes. National security, national currency, this note secured by bonds in the United States. The first national bank of Beardstown. Whoa, whoa. Nice, I like it. You'll notice you've seen this template before, this design. So a lot of the, even the, the exact designs, many banks will, will share that same design, even though the note itself is specific. This is the note of the National Bank of Beardstown. There's some more, like this note, Bank of North America. First National Gold Bank at San Francisco, $50, redeemable in gold coin. This note is secured by bonds of the United States deposited with the US, US Treasury at Washington. There's some others. Pretty cool. Um, if you remember a few lectures back when we talked about J uh, Japan in the 19th century, I, you may remember I said the Japanese actually used the US national banknote template in order to uh, and, and model their own paper currency after national banknotes so you can see now where where they where they were coming from um, new york city like during the free banking era was the financial capital all right new york city is where all the big banks were there's a picture of new york city around 1900 a early skyscraper and uh and that, like i said that's where the big banks were and and at risk of confusing you a little bit, and I, I won't go into too much detail here, there were three sets of national banks. So this is, you know, the free banking system, you know, it's one way, national banking system, there are some parallels there, but it's also quite a bit more complicated, and, and this complicates it quite a bit. There were three sets of national banks according to the law. Um, you had central reserve city banks, reserve city banks, and country banks, okay? The first was had the priority, Central Reserve City Banks. These banks were New York City banks. Only New York City banks could be in this first class. So this helps elevate, I mean, New York City by this point already was the financial capital, but this further boosts their standing as financial capital of the U.S. Only New York City national banks could qualify for this class. And one of the requirements was that they had 25% reserve ratio. That's a pretty high reserve ratio. 25% reserve ratio for um, specie, in specie. The second class were reserve city banks. These were national banks located in cities with more than half a million people, which in these days was about six cities. So if you had over half a million people, you could qualify you were a reserve city bank. For example, Philadelphia had more than half a million people. Philadelphia banks counted as reserve city banks. These two required a 25% reserve ratio. However, 
half of that, half of those reserves, so 12.25%, could be held on deposit in one of these banks. Okay, hmm. So if you're a Philadelphia bank, you need a 25% reserve ratio, but half of those reserves you can deposit in this Central Reserve City Bank. Now, why would you do that? Oh, because you could get interest on your deposit. And so all the Reserve City Banks took advantage of this option and deposited half of their reserve deposits in the New York City Banks. The New York City Banks, in turn, could count that, could count that deposit from the Reserve City Banks as part of their reserves. Okay, now you may be kind of getting here, it's extremely complicated, but you might begin to see you know, a, a potential problem here. And by the way, if you wanted to be a, a national bank in one of these big cities, um, the, the minimum capital requirements were, were quite high. I mean, you had to have at least $200,000, I believe, in most cases. So these are, this is the National Park Bank of New York. This was a central reserve city bank. So too was this one. And then the third level, country banks. And most national banks were country banks. Okay, they're spread out throughout throughout the country and any in any place with with fewer than half a million people. These had a minimum reserve ratio of only 15%, so less. Not only that, but up to 60% of this 15% reserve could be held on deposit in either this bank or in that bank. And once again, the reserves of these country banks, if deposited, which they usually did so they could earn interest, if deposited in one of these banks, would count for as, as the reserves here, okay. Would count as reserves when the bank inspector would come by, right? And so essentially what you have here is a system in which most of the specie is located in the big cities and especially in New York, all right? It created um, somewhat of a pyramid type structure. Um, and, and to illustrate, this is the free banking system, okay? This is a free banking system, a bit more of a simpler system. If each bank, each bank has their notes and deposits here and then their their reserves but they kept the reserves at their own bank okay they kept the reserves at their own bank under the national banking system it looks more like this okay where the country banks reserve city banks and new york city banks all pyramid off each other sharing reserves which might seem to work but the consequence of it it can get a bit wobbly and during times of panic you know, all that needed to happen was for it to tip over the, the New York City banks to start going under and then the entire system like a house of cards would would collapse. It created essentially a pyramid of country banks expanding on top of the reserves of sit, reserve city banks who expanded on top of New York City banks. And so national banks, I have here in my notes, pyramided off a relatively small base of reserves in the New York banks. Uh, <laughs> complicated, yes, but hopefully you see the problem here. You see the problem. Um, during times of panic or crisis, this was, this could topsy-turvy. And then the fourth element of the system, you still had state banks. You still had state banks who were chartered only by the states, not by the national government, not by the federal government. These states were prohibited now from issuing banknotes. So prior to the Civil War, state banks could issue banknotes. After the Civil War, they were no longer allowed to issue banknotes. Actually, Congress had to pass an act um, and, and place a tax of 10% on any state banknotes, which was a prohibitive tax and essentially outlawed the issuing of state banknotes. So state banks cannot issue banknotes. And most people at first thought they would just go away and national banks would dominate, but they actually didn't go away. They just said, okay, that's fine. And instead just worked with deposits, um, accepted deposits into their bank and then made loans 
But instead of loaning out their own paper currency like they did before the Civil War, they loaned national banknotes, which the state banks received by, by, um, by keeping uh, deposits in the national banks. Um, so by 1873, there's still over a thousand state banks and their deposits totaled um, almost $800 million. So state banks haven't gone away and because they keep, they keep reserves too in the country banks and the reserve city banks and the central reserve city banks, it, it con the state banks constitute a sort of fourth layer in the, in the national banking period. So whew, <laughs> that's the system. In some ways, I think the Federal Reserve is easier to explain than the national banking system. National banking system is a bit confusing. It had problems, okay? It also had successes. I mean, you, you remember Part A, the, the Industrial Revolution was financed by these notes, okay? This financed the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution was spectacularly successful in the United States in the late 19th century. So let's give credit where credit is due. Uh, this functioned fairly well. By 1907, 1910, it seems a bit outdated and and there's a movement to replace it we'll get to that maybe next week um but anyway that's that's the long and uh, short of it uh hope that made a little bit of sense uh and if not you know that's okay uh, i think you still have a, the general idea all right thank you very much and i'll see you next time for lecture 27 bye